Have you always had this weird. kind of ongoing conversation with God? I call these conversations no, open. No, no. It really, I was sort of like uh, borderline on the fence, not really knowing. Uh, go ahead, prove it to me. I, I still don't believe that you should pray and things come from praying. But, you know, there is a spirit, an energy, a force. There is something that makes things happen that you are not aware of. But I said, I just proved it to myself. I just proved it. This is Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. Those moments when heaven and earth collide could be an encounter with an angel or divine interventions. Moments where God says, see me, I'm right here, right now. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. Could be in a phone call, if you make the call. You know, when you get, uh, someone's on your heart, as they say, playing in your head, it's just somebody out of the blue. They're just, it's like, I should call them. Well, I, I should call them. Do you make the call? When that happens, do you call? Sometimes. Depends, right? Depends on who it is, how long it's been since you've talked to them, how weird it would seem. It's just, you know, why are you calling me? Make the call. There's a reason. God's trying to connect you. He is. As is proven in this episode, Diane Fleming made the call, and it was like she had to jump through hoops. But at the end of it, a prayer was answered. Two prayers were answered. The unexpected ways God answers our prayers. Often, our prayer answers somebody else's prayer. That happens a lot when you think about it. I'm picturing, you know, in those old movies, you'll see like in an office setting, secretary answers the phone. She's got that giant switchboard. They used to have those switchboards where just giant panel with holes in it. And she had actual physical wires and she would have to connect your call to that office up there. And then this call is going into that person. So she just has this giant pile of spaghetti, what looks like these wires connected into the switchboard. Well, there's God up there with the newfangled heavenly version of making these connections. Your prayer, let's see, who could answer your prayer over here? I need to connect you because we're social beings and God keeps us social. He has us, he loves having us relying on other people, right? The body of Christ kind of thing, right? We're all one big family. We're his kids. Let's get to know each other. You need to talk to that person. Oh, you have a need? There you, your answer is over. It's just fascinating to watch this all come to be. If you kind of take a step back, even when we pray for something and we want to connect to that person, he says, no, 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 no. I'm going to make you, I'm sorry, I'm going to make you wait a little longer, but I want you connected over there. We had that recently with us. Uh, our daughter is back uh, from California, six years away. She has some furniture she wanted to keep, so she moves the furniture out here. Now we have more furniture we know what to do with. We need to unload some furniture. You would think it would be so easy just to unload furniture. I just want to give it away. I'm just happy to give it away. But, you know, different organizations want different things, don't want other things. No, I'm sorry, we don't walk upstairs to get No, no, you have to bring it downstairs. I don't want to carry it. Can't you? No. So if, <laughs> we're going through this just trying to unload furniture until... My wife, Beth, being open to the spirit, shall we say, she's talking uh, to somebody up at the church and just, just small talk. It's just small talk about things going on in their lives, furniture. And he says, Mark says, oh, you need to talk to such and such organization. She does. Oh, there's a, a young woman, a, a young new mom. Uh, we're helping her set up an apartment. Right now, all they have is two sleeping bags for her and her two-year-old. Now they have, they both have a bed, and there's a dresser, and there's a desk, and there's now a uh, living room sofa and a living room chair. And now she has this. She has, she, her prayer was answered, and so was ours. Two prayers answered. God just making those wonderful connections. It's you know, where are we going today, Jesus? Who are you leading me to? Am I answering a prayer? Is a prayer being answered for me? Are we both getting a prayer answered? Fascinating to watch. Uh, let's start with Diane Fleming. Diane Fleming heard me on Coast to Coast, uh, the uh, Coast to Coast AM all night radio show. And what struck her was what she calls synchronicity. And that is what we're talking about now, God's synchronicity. Well, you were, you were very honest and you had some wonderful insights about, you know, how people have synchronous, synchronistic things happen to them and they should uh, be aware. You know, it's like the whole thing is don't just ignore things that happen to you. You should be aware and pick up on them because they could have some serious meaning. They could save your life or you could meet somebody you should always have, you know, it's important for you to meet. Synchronicity. Um, I had a very old friend that I hadn't spoken to in a very long time, and I had no reason to call her. But as I am very busy and I have things to do at home, I used to be a designer. She used to be a designer. I didn't know what she was up to. It was 10 years since I had seen her. But something 
it was like something was forcing me to, you have to call her. You have to find her number. You have to call her. Just call her. And I had no reason to. That's what made it so weird. I, I was pinching myself going, why do I feel so motivated to call this person that I have very little in common with? And I haven't spoken. There's no reason. Okay. So I call my friends trying to find her, her old number. I didn't have it. So eventually I came up with this number. It took me like an hour or more. And um, when I called, I said, gee, you know, it's nice to talk to you. And she was confused. Why you, you know, what's this about? It's like, I actually don't know. <laughs> and we talked about what's new in our lives. And I said, well, I had gotten married and he happens to be a photographer and he's looking to sell his black and white lab equipment. So that's what we're doing right now. She goes, do you know, I have been praying steadily for a whole week, nothing but praying for somehow a black and white lab just to fall into my lap for very little money because I can't afford anything. Period. That made my jaw drop. Which one of you needed the lab? Which one had the lab and which one needed the lab? The, my husband was selling an, uh, lab equipment, and she was praying for a week with her Bible, asking somehow the universe to bring her a black and white lab because she couldn't afford it, but she needed it for doing her own work to, to show. And um, she's like, this, this is that's, 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 that's pretty needed. good. That's pretty good. And she came all the way out, and we saw each other for, after 10 years. I said, now I know why I was motivated to call you. And it wasn't me. It was something else. And I said to myself, if this ever happens again, where I feel, I started asking, like, just use me. If that's what it is that I can help people out, just I'll pay attention. Uh, just use me. Go right ahead and make me a conduit of good things to happen. So I just kind of put it out there saying, go ahead, do it again. This is great. So, do you, have you yeah, always had this kind of ongoing conversation with God? I call these conversations, uh, this ongoing conversation where you're just no, open. No, no. It really, I was sort of like uh, borderline on the fence, not really knowing if I believed or not, mm -hmm. you know. I was more the scientific sort of, I'm an artist, but I'm also very, I was feet on the ground thinking that, you know, uh, go ahead, prove it to me. I, I still don't believe that you should pray and things come from praying. But the more I listened to Coast to Coast, which uh, an old friend of mine told me about, I started thinking, you know, there is a spirit, an energy, a force. There is something that makes things happen that you are not aware of. But I said, I just proved it to myself. I just proved it. I was like a living example that changed my attitude and made me much more open to all kinds of things. And I just figure I'm more spiritual. I'm not, you know, I don't go to church, but I'm spiritual. I, I just want to do good by everybody if I can. Thank you, Diane Fleming. And I'm going to save one of her stories till the end because she had a moment of divine intervention that saved her life. She has what she called, when she lived in this one particular house, a killer garage. It tried to kill her. You'll hear that story and how God saved her. Divine intervention coming up at the end of this episode. But right now we're looking at these unexpected ways that God answers our prayers. FaceTime audio call with Chris Ferrero. Very bright guy. PhD, college professor. What are you PhD and in? Political science, more specifically intelligence and national security studies. So as you might imagine, I could fill an entire workday just watching the news these days. Let's go back 20 years when Chris was just entering college. Well, mm -hmm. you sent me an interesting uh, email of your college days a blink ago, a blink ago when you were in college. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I found it I found it absolutely fascinating, especially the payoff, the payoff along along the way. You're kind of going. Yeah. Yeah. So but then there's the payoff. So go ahead. What was what was going on in your life back then? Well, my freshman year of college, I had a great group of guys on my dorm floor and um, one of them got sick uh, December of that year. So this wasn't someone that I had a, a long friendship with. I don't want to exaggerate our closeness, but he was part of a tight knit group of guys, uh, a series of friendships that were developing during that formative freshman year of college. And so it hit you especially hard. You know, you make some friends in college, and even though they're fun to hang out with at that stage of life, you also know kind of that they're jerks and that, you know, the friendship won't last beyond college. But uh, this guy, Chris, his name is also Chris, uh, was just a tremendously nice guy. And it turned out that he had leukemia. 
and he passed away from it by the end of that year. So that would have been, I believe, May 1998, Memorial Day weekend, I went to his funeral. And I grew up Catholic, um, and I actually you know, really believed in it. I just didn't go through the motions. And I had also lost someone close to me before, grandparents. Uh, my Nana had died just the year before. And it was very sad, but you know, she was 80, so there wasn't this sense of cosmic injustice involved in her loss. It was just the sadness that is part of life. Uh, but uh, Chris's death really threw me for a loop, and it didn't just challenge my faith and my sense of God's justice, but it, I think it just changed my overall mood and my ability to enjoy life, to go about a day with a sense of innate joy that I typically had. Uh, and... A few months after his death, I don't remember exactly when it was. It might have been fall because I think hot chocolate is part of this story. And I don't think I was drinking hot chocolate in August. Uh, but I was home in Connecticut. And I had been in a funk for a few months. And I went out with a couple of my friends who I typically went out with when we were home from college. And we went into Hartford and hit up a couple of our places there. And I just wasn't really having much fun that night. I just really felt this deep sense of grievance, and uh, I was in a funk, spiritual funk, and it was even affecting my ability to have fun. We finish up uh, at the bar, and we're walking down the street. I drove that night, and I think we were debating whether or not to stop uh, one more place, and a guy comes upon us, and he has this air of desperation. And he doesn't look like a drug addict. Uh, he doesn't look homeless. Uh, he, he's not you know, clean-cut guy from central casting for a job as an accountant or anything. Um, maybe a, his hair pulled back, a, a bit of a beard. And he asks us for money. He explains that he had come up on a bus from New Haven, which is about an hour south. And his uh, friend had not met him. And he couldn't get a hold of his friend. This is, by the way... 1998, so cell phones aren't ubiquitous at that time. And uh, he also said that he didn't have the money to get home, and he just wanted to get home to New Haven on the bus, and he needed bus fare. How old does he look? Maybe in his 30s. Okay. And my friends politely brush him off, and that's typically what I would do too. I'm not the type of person who typically gives money out left and right to people that come up on the street with, um, you know, with some sort of sob story. Uh, but this just felt different, and my friends are politely letting him down, saying, well, you know, you should maybe talk to the police and you know, maybe there's a shelter where you could stay for the night. Basically saying, we think you're homeless without explicitly saying that. And I just had this deep sense that this man needed somebody to believe him. And I asked him how much he needed. And he said $12. And it's kind of retrospectively interesting that I consider 12 to be my lucky number, even before this happened. And, uh, I just had this profound sense that this is okay. This is not a con. This man needs help. We live in a cynical world. He just needs somebody to believe him. So I say, I'll take care of you. And he just has this tremendous sense of relief come over him. And he starts to explain that he works at a restaurant. He tells me his name. I can't remember it. He works at a restaurant down in New Haven. And he's legit. And he said, I'll give you my driver's license and give me your address, and I'll send you $12 when I get home. And when you get it, I can, you can return my driver's license to me. And I said, just, just don't worry about it. Just go ahead and take the money and get home. And so he says, thank you so much. And he goes off toward the bus station. And I have this tremendous sense of well-being come over me that I hadn't had in a long time. Uh, and my friends and I believe we stopped at Dunkin' Donuts for a hot chocolate. That's why I think this might have been in the fall. And we sat there, and I enjoyed myself more drinking that hot chocolate than I had in several months. And so we drive home, and so far the story is pretty ho-hum, but we are getting to the payoff. I drop off my second friend. The radio had been turned off. I turn the radio on as I'm backing out of his driveway. And a song came on the radio. It was a pop song from a few years previous, so it was not on the radio routinely anymore. And the song was Joan Osborne's What If God Was One of Us. And the lyrics go, what if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on a bus trying to make his way home. And I just knew. I had tremendous chills. I said, oh, my God, that was a message that 
God is real. God is good. And that was how I snapped out of my funk after this friend's death. Uh, it was something so simple, communication through music. And so I wonder, you know, was this person even real or was he an angel sent with a mission to intercept me on the street and touch my heart and get me to give him $12 and then to hear that song on the radio? Um, it was worth the $12, I can tell you that. Just a stranger on a bus trying to make his way home. It's not, that is so good. That is just so good. You know, I got it chills really now. I, I, got the, I got the same chills you had when it happened. Because when that happens, and anyone knows the, this series, or particularly the Blind Faith Live podcast series, every week I got a different song. And I'm trying to, I think, I think one week one, the song was that song, for whatever reason it was for us that, that in that episode. But there's no question God uses music. There's no and the radio, and he can do anything he wants. I, I think in, in your case, my sense is, no matter how you look at it, it all ends up miraculous, whether that was an angel specifically given a job and that song came up on the radio and God just spun that all together, or it's a guy who needs some help. You give him that help, which brings you up out of your doldrums, because anytime we stop thinking about ourselves and help somebody else, we come out of ourselves and life is good again. And that song was, was only played in your car. I mean, no matter how you look at it, it's all miraculous. It's just God being God. <laughs> it really was. And I never had any doubt about it. I mean, I've given money to beggars on the street before at various points in my life. I've lived in a few big cities. And, you know, you kind of know that what you're doing is probably buying this guy's next hit. But you kind of roll the dice and hope that, well, you know, hopefully I really am helping this guy uh, get a sandwich, even though deep down I know he's probably lying to me. Uh, but I never had any doubt about this one. Yeah. And uh, people I tell the story to, they also get chills and they believe it was legitimate as well. Um, and you speak of music being a medium by which God communicates. That wasn't the only time. I have one other cool story. It's not as cool. But um, it was the summer after my senior year of college. And the girl that I dated, my senior year of college broke up with me and I was pretty torn up about it in retrospect now years later I don't know why but you know when at the time especially when you're still young those things really really hurt and um I was home alone staying at my parents that summer uh cuz I was going to be starting graduate school in the fall and they were away on vacation so I was kind of lonely I had the house to myself I had worked all day I was a Domino's delivery guy and uh I get home and it's about midnight and I'm brushing my teeth before bed and I had a radio in my bathroom and I was on a country music kick at the time and a song comes on that I found tremendously ironic. It was uh, Travis Tritt. It's a great day to be alive. And I remember listening to that song thinking, oh my gosh, this is so ironic. And I finished brushing my teeth and I was about to turn the radio off and go to bed, but something told me... Uh, just hold on, see what song comes on next. And the song that came on next was a Garth Brooks hit uh, where he's, I can't think of the name of the song, but he's looking back at a girl that he dated. Um, he's now with his wife at a football game. And I think Unanswered Prayers is the name of the song. Uh, the song is Unanswered Prayers. And he's looking at this girlfriend that he used to be tremendously in love with. And he's so grateful that God did not answer his prayers to end up with that person because now here he was with his wife and and he had pr the perspective he needed to know that she was not the one and uh, I took that as some consolation at the time too so I do think that music is a medium that God uses uh, yeah and, and country music in particular cuts to the heart better than any kind of music I I'm not heavy into country music but but boy do they go to the heart better than than any music out there like that who you know, there is no pop song, I don't think, with the equivalent of thanking God for not answering a prayer that I'm not with that person, but with this person. You know, that is very country. That's very country. You know, I can't even understand the lyrics of most pop songs nowadays, so your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I know. That's why when music bubbles up, it's like, well, does this actually mean something? I mean, I, I look at that song again, and I, I don't know. Tell me if you can hear this. I'm going to go back to your first song here. Hang on one second here. Okay. Tell, me, tell me if you can hear this. Hold on here. What if God was one of us? Do you hear that? Yes. Okay. Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus. Trying to make his way home. Okay, so that's my reader reading it to me. So then the next the next thing 
is kind of like the exclamation mark on this. And this has to do with what we're about here. Listen to this. If God had a face, what would it look like? And would you want to see if seeing meant that you would have to believe in things like heaven and in Jesus and the saints and all the prophets? That you would have to believe in things like Jesus and the saints and the prophets. You know, when you have these kinds of experiences, are there is is there any other option other than to say there is? You know, there is a God, there is a Jesus, there are saints, there are prophets. It's all connected. You know, it's all connected. And it's so simple, even a PhD can get it. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it feels good to get it. We get so tied up in the material world that we're living in, uh, our concerns of the day, um, the concerns that our modern society gives us. And it's very comforting, even if you do have that bit of doubt, because even as, even as a person of faith, I routinely experience doubt. Um, but I can't imagine not having at least those moments where you reconnect with God and, and realize that you're, you're part of something loving and greater. Uh, because it makes the rest of life <laughs> a little bit more bearable. I think Marx was right when he said that religion is the opiate of the masses, and I'm happy to keep smoking it. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for what you're doing with the podcast. I have really enjoyed since I discovered it. I don't think I've listened to every episode, but uh, there's some terrific stuff, and it's validating to hear other people's experiences and just your delivery, the way you sound. You sound like a genuinely happy person. There are some people, so many podcasts I listen to actually are kind of professionally related for me, things about the disposition of nuclear weapons around the world. And journalistic voices can be so foreboding. And you're just so happy sounding. It's refreshing. Ah, thanks, Chris. Chris Ferrero. I, I, I am happy to do to do this podcast, share these stories. I do need your your story. You haven't shared your story with me yet. Don't make me mad. Don't make me come out there. Um, so go to touchbyheaven.net and uh, share your story with me. We'll connect and uh, let other people hear it as well. See? Encounters. Wonderful encounters. Was that an angel or you think that was just a regular guy? Eh? The song, was it just on his radio or everywhere? How did God, how does that switchboard again? He's just up there, let's see, connect this. And where there is no connection, I'll just make it happen somewhere. I don't know. However, God does this stuff. He's spaghetti. He's got so many spaghetti wires in his switchboard. Ah, it's amazing, amazing. We are veiled in how much God loves us. No question about it. We are veiled. We live in a fallen world. We just don't feel love the way we should. We just don't. And so there's just, we don't get the full impact of it. We're not going to feel it I, I, until it's over, until this physical life is over. And then we're like, oh, that's what everyone's talking about in these near-death experiences. We just don't feel it. And what is it? it says in Matthew, I just looked it up, it says in Matthew that that quote about Look how our heavenly Father takes care of the birds, and aren't we so much more important than the birds? And look how, look how, look how He's taking care of them. Why are we so worried about everything? He's there making the connections for us. He cares so much about us. He loves us so much. He loves the birds, but He loves us so much more. But the lesson is still there about the birds, right, Linda Bream? All right. Well, you know my one about the bird, right around the time that. Um I feel like I needed to know that my prayers were being heard. Well, okay, so that was a hot summer day, mid-July, 90-some degrees outside. I was inside in the air conditioning as my kids were out. No, actually, just my son was outside playing, and he came in and said, Mom, there's like this sick bird that's just been sitting on the concrete for like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. It's not moving. I don't know what's wrong with it. And sure enough, I mean, I came out shortly after my daughter came out. I mean, this bird was just peculiar. It was really hot. It was not a shaded area. It was in the full sunlight, just sitting there. Um, we weren't sure. I mean, its eyes were open. It wouldn't like move. We didn't touch it, but we kind of just circled around it and just waited for something to happen. We didn't know. So my kids were just really worried. Can you call the vet? Can you, you know, I'm like, oh, honey, you know, can you, can you call, can you call Philip? Because they knew at the time I was, you know, listening to Blind Faith Live. And, um, and I said, oh, you know, he's a, he's a busy man. Well, what, can you call Dr. Namie? Well, you know, I don't really, you know, know him well enough to call Dr. Namie. I said, okay, guys, I don't know what to do about this bird. By now it's 20 minutes. I mean, this bird, something's very wrong with it. Um, I said, well, when Dr. Namie prays, okay, you guys, he says, come Holy Spirit, 
in the name of Jesus. And I, I didn't even get the Jesus out. Like as I was saying it, this bird up and flew away. <laughs> and I mean, it was pretty crazy because my it. kids, you know, <laughs> their jaws dropped. I sort of looked in amazement like, what? And so, I don't know, to me, I said, well, you guys see, I'm telling you, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you call them and you, you, you include them in every prayer. And I'll tell you, miracles happen. That was amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. And he loves us more than that bird. He does. It's true, animal lovers. Get over it. He loves us more. Yes, he does. <laughs> Tree huggers. He loves us more than the trees. Sorry, it's true. He does. And that is demonstrated so much by these divine interventions where God puts a hand in and saves somebody's life. And I'll have that story bringing Diane Fleming back into the picture here again about what happened in her garage many years ago. She doesn't live in that house anymore and that killer garage. But that's coming up in a moment. But first, three things. Number one, subscribe. Please subscribe to the podcast. Number two, if you would like me to send you links to these uh, encounter stories that may or may not make the podcast, as well as a link to the weekly podcast, and just, just stuff that I come across, if you'd like me to send you this kind of information, uh, go into touchbyheaven.net. It's in this week's postings. She, uh, Beth put it on the uh, the website. And uh, just uh, sign up. And number three, if you need a speaker for an upcoming event and think I might be your guy, go to trapperjackspeaks.com. Check out the video and the information there, trapperjackspeaks.com. Uh, I'll tell you the story because this also is an unexpected way God answered a prayer of mine. Uh, th this is a case where, have you had those moments where God answers the prayer before you ask? You haven't even considered asking because it just sounds, yeah, 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 I can't ask that. Or you don't even think about it, but, but he answers it. When I knew that this, that, that, and, and speaking, public speaking, it's a business. Like anything else, it's a business. There's a way of going about the business. And I don't know how to do that business. I, I don't know. But, but kind of falling in front of me was this course. It was like, if you want to be able to do the business, shall we say, of, of, of this uh, sign up for the course. It's a thousand bucks. I'm going. I, I can't. I can't. I can't rationalize a thousand dollars. I can't. I couldn't rationalize it. A thousand. That thousand bucks. Uh, yes. Would it help me? Yeah. Would it pay pay for itself? Yeah. But I just you know. No. Nah. I, I I didn't say anything to Beth. Didn't say a word. No. No. I was just kind of. I just, I blew it off. That I, I'll 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 uh, slug it out of my own. It'll be all right. That night, I was giving a talk to a group. And uh, a woman that we know, not real well, but a woman that we know came up and she said, hey, thanks for coming out, preparing for this. And look, this is so nice you're doing this. I know you're not getting paid for it. And she, she said, here's a card. Here's just a thank you card from me and open it later and that kind of thing, right? Uh, so I gave him a talk. Then we went home and, and Beth opened up the card. And uh, are you ahead of me on this? Yeah. Inside was a check. And she says, do you know how much this individual wrote the check for? And I said, um, if it's a thousand dollars, I'm going to go beat somebody up. <laughs> and Beth said, it's a thousand dollars. And I said, well, Beth, here's why it's a thousand dollars. This is God answering a prayer that I didn't even ask, but he wants me to do this. Obviously God wants me to do this. So obviously we signed up for the course and it's paying for itself and all that. But that just lets you know that God in his incredibly merciful, unexpected ways answers prayers before we even ask them sometimes, you know? And sometimes you don't even have to ask. God just does his divine intervention thing because if your time's not up, your time's not up. And if you are serving out your purpose as you're supposed to be and whatever, whatever, however, God does this in his own beautiful way. Here is a beautiful divine intervention story from Diane Fleming here on Touched by Heaven. Everyday Encounters with God. And so I spent 23 years literally bent double doing my work. For 23 years, Diane was bent over in the garage doing her amazing artwork, and that was the place for divine intervention. My killer garage, yeah. 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 Just the fact that something was weird, something was off when I was preparing to, to do my usual work that I do every day, making another background, you know, painting a big scenic thing for, for somebody. I usually take a certain amount of time, and it's no problem. You know, I can figure it out pretty well. But for some reason, I felt like I was just, everything was just taking me three times as long. And I was getting so frustrated. And I was like, ugh. You know, am I ever going to be able to start this thing? And um, so 
as soon as I was just about to begin, literally, I just had my roller in the paint. I was just going back and forth. I go, okay, I'm about to turn around. And all of a sudden, I fell backwards because of the immediate bang that I heard and felt come into the garage door. And I thought, who the heck could drive up my driveway and slam into the garage? Nobody. The garage door was fine. But when I looked up, I saw I have this gigantic old, old spring that's about like four inches in diameter, very thick, and it's like eight foot long. And it's the kind that can help pull up like uh, very heavy wooden garage doors, and I had two of them. And so one of them all of a sudden just decided after 50 years it would snap. And that thing was swinging, its arm was just going back and forth, back and forth, right around the space. Just think, like an eight-foot thing going back and forth. That covers a lot of territory. And that's what had made such a loud bang that it had busted the metal that holds it. And, I mean, it broke it and bent it in half. And this piece of metal was really thick, and it was just completely in half. Now, if I had been anywhere near that, I'm telling you, my head would have exploded like a pumpkin. Or could have taken off an arm. I mean, it was that volatile. So you weren't so, standing where you normally would have been standing at that moment. I immediately realized my life was saved. I mean, I was on the ground in a panic, but still, I wasn't in the middle with blood splattered all over. I was like, I thought I, thought I was the luckiest person alive. Divine Intervention for Diane Fleming. Thanks, Diane, for your story. And we have a link to her artwork as well, artforms.com. It's a plural, artforms.com, the link in the uh, show notes. All right, the takeaways from today's episode. Be open. Be open to how God answers prayers, and sometimes we are the answer to prayers. Helping somebody else can get us out of a funk. It can get rid of black and white photo lab equipment. You never know. You absolutely never know. You can't solve all the problems in the world. You can only solve the one that's sitting there right in front of you. The one that's right in front of you. That's the one we can help solve. So we are the answer to prayers, and God's just plugging us. He put us in that spot at that moment to help somebody else. That's the takeaway. Stay open and just ask, hey, Jesus, where are we going today? (laughs) That's it. Thanks for listening to Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. I do need your story. Go to touchedbyheaven.net and contact me. Let me know what your story is. And uh, who knows? It could be on an upcoming episode here at Touched by Heaven. Net. I will see you next week. I'm Trapper Jack. Just a slob like one of us. <laughs>